Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. This is the Enslaved series. It's a multi-part program, and today we're doing Empire of Blood, Europe 1544 to 1807, with my good friend, Professor Ed, joining us from Georgetown University. Before Ed begins his presentation, let's go through just a few items, introductory type stuff. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So if you're watching in Zoom, um, you can let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and if you're ready for spring in the chat or the Q&A. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can do the same in the comments. It's always interesting to find out where people are joining us from. So welcome, thanks for being here, and happy Sunday. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, we don't have time, unfortunately, to do a Zoom demonstration, but usually there's just a couple things that people want to know how to do. One of them is how to adjust the sound volume. So we did a sound test earlier. Everything seems to be working fine. If you want to adjust the sound on your session, you should check the settings locally on your own device. And then sometimes people want to know how to adjust the video or the screen display so that the slides that we're presenting take up the full screen. If you want that to happen and it's not currently taking place, look in Zoom, uh, in your Zoom session, at the top of the screen, there should be something called either view or view options, depending on the type of device you're using, and you'll want to check the side by side mode. Um, throughout our program, if you have any questions or comments or run into any kind of technical issues, uh, feel free to let us know in the chat and the Q&A will be monitoring that. Um, you can do the chat and the Q&A if you're in Zoom or the comments section if you're on Facebook. Those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington DC History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. Uh, our mission is to bring people together to experience the history and culture of Washington DC and other places throughout the world. And I will not really be your host today. I'm kind of more of like the um, MC. Uh, Ed is the uh, speaker today, but just FYI, I'm the founder of the Washington DC History and Culture Organization. And my good friend Ed from Georgetown is going to be joining us, and this is his third presentation to our group. Um, I'll let I'll let him tell you all about himself and what he's going to be talking about in just a minute. Um, but just as a introductory part, um, Ed previously gave a presentation called "Enslaved Washington D.C. 1790 through 2021." He gave that presentation twice. If you weren't able to join us for that, it, there's a recording of it on our YouTube page. Um, and just as a introductory note, if you're not familiar with us, we have quite a few history programs recorded on our YouTube page. I think we're up to like around 40, um, all different types of topics related to history, art, culture, film, music, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you can check us out, Washington, D.C. History and Culture on YouTube. And again, Ed's previous program, uh, Enslaved Washington, D.C. 1790 to 2021, there's a recording of it on there. And so with that, I will turn things over to Ed, and he's going to go through today's topic. Ed, take it away. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first. Perfect. Perfectly. All things set? Yep, perfect.
everyone and welcome. My name is Ed Ingebretson and uh, today's um, topic, pretty dark for the first day of spring, Europe, the scramble for the Caribbean, the plundering of indigenous African peoples, 1444-1914. And if you're an accountant and you're looking at the different dates that are coming up on the screen, most of them are kind of averages and most of them are uh, depending on how you're calculating. The 1441 is the first uh, enslaved um, uh, ship from Portugal in 1914 it is the middle of the war and the end of what we would call the scramble for Africa. Uh, it's a lot to cover in an hour and a half. Um, I try to start on time and we'll try to end on time. Empire of Blood. Martin Luther King cites a 19th century New England minister, Theodore Parker, when he preached, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Does it? First, a word on what we do here today, and I say we because it is a communal action. How does memory and retelling move towards justice? Remembering undoes no action, convicts no one, unlocks no chain, frees no person. Memory itself can enslave. So I begin this afternoon with four cautions central to any project of recuperative memory. Whose narrative is telling? Who benefits and in what ways? Social, emotional, psychological, economic, all of the above. Is a work of memory or memorial, and they're different, the same as restorative justice or reparative justice? And are those the same? Or does memorial in all its forms, words and retellings built out of stones and ceremonies built into structures, silence the need for change? I'm a white man of European descent. This afternoon, I tell history is not my own, but I live within a social and a social structure designed to benefit me in countless, really unnoticed ways from these tragedies. The moral arc does not inevitably incline towards justice. I disagree with uh, Justice Parker and uh, Martin Luther King slightly. So here today, this afternoon, we, again, all of us, continue to incline it forward. The telling we make is only one. And should it be silenced, even these stones will cry out. And this image is the um, slave market monument in Zanzibar. Uh, the chains on the uh, stone individuals were actual chains taken at the time of the last enslaved trip. My politics should be pretty clear and you'll see it as we go through. Capitalism and slavery, Greg Grandin's great book, each generation seems condemned to have to prove the obvious anew. Slavery created the modern world and the modern world divisions are the products of slavery. Karl Marx, my favorite, the turning of Africa into a warm for the commercial hunting of black skins, that is the slave trade, signaled the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. Throughout my presentation in terms of usage, I will not use the word slavery unless it's in a quote from someone else. I will generally remind us that slavery as an abstraction is like homeless. They're homeless persons. So these are enslaved persons. And, and back to the point. So yes, the modern world as we know it all comes back to a point, whether we're talking about the eternal Treblinka, the Holocaust and uh, its echoes in the slave trade, uh, whether we're talking about um, Marjorie Siegel, the, the dreadful comparison, how human and animal enslavement uses the same kinds of technologies and developments, whether you were talking about how the new world itself it made an economy, a social structure, and a case called the enslaved. Uh, in Mr. Du Bois is the suppression of the African slave trade, probably the first uh, native voice in the United States to speak at such a length. Book in the, in the left corner, 
uh, very important how the North promoted and prolonged and profited slavery complicity. We tend to think that the enslavement is someone else's problem someplace else. It's all of ours. And the other topic, the other slavery. Uh, the 1619 project, which I like a lot, has only one significant failing that, that I can see. Uh, it starts in 1619, but enslavement started with Christopher Columbus and the five boatloads of Taino Indians, indigene, that he returned from Hispanola back to, back to Spain with. That was in 1495. From 1495 until 1619, you have 125 years in which Spanish and colonial persons uh, kidnapped, um, committed genocide, and used indigenous persons in the islands and the colonies. This is before um, this, the, before African American, or as I would call them, Black American, in, in um, 1607. When uh, Martin Luther King, by the way, writes, "Why we can't wait," his essential point is is that our country begins in genocide. And we can go to the Declaration of Independence when you see that first kind of apology by Thomas Jefferson about how King George, whom we'll talk about later, himself uh, has, has loosed uh, his armies and, may, and brought the savages of the Indians out against us. That's the first blast of what will continuing to be a, an echoing series of policies and social commitments against people not like us. Stealing human lives, enslavement for economic gain, sadism, political domination is not limited to country, nation, ethnicity, or empire. Enslavement predates recorded history and it's in the news this week in Atlanta in a surprising way. It continues still, often in forms not acknowledged as Atlanta. The presentation this afternoon tracks the development of one cycle of enslavement across one colonizing empire in the region that became Europe. I will consider how European proto nations developed a global commerce and atrocity across the Middle East, sub Saharan trade routes, a lust for resources, lands, persons, shamefully motivated what would become an empire of blood, a systematic genocide justified explained, confirmed in the name of gods, because the gods were many, for national glory and glory. Subsequent presentations that I'll make will examine a back narrative that historically becomes central, the developing ideology of whiteness across Western nations as it hardens into a legal case in Anglo-colonial US history. I will also track a similar moment hardening into the Nazi death factories in Europe and how that developed in the US as the white ethno state. Three essential sections this afternoon a brief overview of pre modern enslavement, three points Aristotle and the ancients, European empires, Christian and Islam, and African. The Brenner Report, Types of Modern Enslavement, probably the topic that most people are here for this traffic in humans, modern colonialism and empire. And there are two waves. We'll be looking first very quickly again. Uh, at wave one, the Portuguese from 1441, mostly in Brazil, the Spanish, uh, the Iberian empires, Portugal and Spain, 1492 through 1521 in the Caribbean and Mexico and onward. And wave two, British in 1655 and colonizing of Jamaica from 1660 to 1770, the Royal African Company about which I have many opinions and so will you when you hear them. And finally, a code, coda, colonialism and the scramble for Africa and restorative justice. And again, we're gonna do all of this in the next hour and 15 minutes. So fasten your seat belts. The man who was the thing, this is Harriet Beecher's title subtitle for Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was the quote, second most popular book in the 19th century next to the Bible. And as, as, Tom, as Abraham Lincoln says, so you're the little woman who started this great big war. Uh, capitalism and enslavement. Uh, the King's uh, Bench in 1783, reviewing a case brought to it, uh, decided this way. The case of slaves was the same as if the horses had been thrown overboard. 30 pounds were awarded to the ship's investors for each of the 132 slaves thrown overboard when the vessel grew short of water. 
no homicide charges were contemplated. The case of slaves was the same as if horses had been thrown overboard. 30 pounds were awarded to the ship's investors for each of the 132 slaves. Eric Williams, who was the uh, kind of the first prime minister of one of the Caribbean countries in his uh, formidable and formative capitalism slavery, is the quote here. So axiomatic, things that I kind of uh, routinely think about. What history teaches us that empires needs bodies and will take them wherever it can. And words always, whether it's history or policy or law or religion, are the means by which empire explains, justifies, confirms, sanctifies to itself why it needs those bodies. Destiny, manifest. Two words used by different countries and different cultures, churches and states, that explain and again justify how a particular empire needed specific bodies taken and put to specific tasks that the empires wouldn't or couldn't do themselves and axiomatic, and so on, and so on, and so on. Chattel enslavement, the use and exploitation of people for labor and sex and other excuses are given predates written records. And I wanna make this clear that this is not about, this is not specifically finger pointing at any one particular uh, cycle of this. It existed in most, likely all cultures. A person could be enslaved from the time of the birth, capture or purchase, Slavery was legal in most societies at some time in the past, but is now outlawed in all recognized countries. That does not mean, as the UN points out every year, most recently in 2019, that 40 million people today are still currently in some form of enslavement. And uh, you, you can look all this material up and I can give you the references should you need it. Enslavement is, however, and this is kind of my mustic, now and has always been a mechanics for and simply put more money. Things we'll talk about this afternoon. Aristotle thought enslavement natural. The quotes are his in bad German, bad Greek. The slave was a living tool. Jewish and Christian and Islamic original documents presume enslavement. A third of Roman population were slaves. The Quran presumes slavery, develops legal practices governing it that the current UN report on enslaved persons is sobering. And some of these stories we know, and on the left you see a, 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 a very old uh, Roman mosaic from Tunisia showing two boys enslaved. And the top and the left you see kind of the classic or originary story and you heard it in the music ahead of time. Um, every Passover, that's what the meaning of the feast is and whether a Jewish or Christian or Islamic uh, there is some reference to this major narrative, major metaphor of enslavement. Most ancient civilizations, Mesopotamia, Old Kingdom, Egypt, Asia, exploited some form of enslavement, whether it was captive, economic, or domestic. But classical Greece and Rome, they are our mentors and our, our political models. They were the first true enslavement societies from the fifth to the third centuries BCE, a third to half of Athens population consisted of enslavements. Enslaved persons constituted as much as 30% of Rome. In 1086, England, 10% of the population was enslaved. Enslavement never disappeared from medieval or modern Europe. It persists across Europe, nation states, empires through the modern times. And it reemerged in the 12th century under the growing impetus of other empires, Northern European, as well as Middle Eastern. In 2019, again, according to UN, 40.3 million still enslaved persons variously in various countries, including the US, 71% female, one in four children. I have a few references on the US later that will be interesting. Um, you've seen images of this, for example, of the, of the New Kingdom era in Egypt, 1500 BCE. It's safe to assume that slavery existed in some form or another from antiquity until the 19th century. So very quickly, here is Aristotle from the Poetics, and I won't give you the bad germ, bad Greek. Let us first speak of master and slave. Property is a part of the household. The art of acquiring property is a part of the art of managing the household. That's kind of Aristotle in his proto-capitalist man man manner. 
And so in the arrangement of the family, a slave is a living possession. Go down to the next, the red. But there is, is anyone there intended by nature to be a slave? And for whom such a condition is expedient and right? Or rather, is not all slavery a violation of nature? There is no difficulty in answering this question on the grounds both of reason and of fact. For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. The Quran, approximately 532 uh, common era. There are three sections here. The first talks, we have been made lawful to thee, thy wives to whom thou hast paid their dowers and those slaves whom thy right hand possesses out of the prisoners whom Allah has assigned to thee. Marry those among you who are single and those who are fit among your male slaves and your female slaves and so on. Uh, the, the Islamic word for worship and the Arabic word for slave are very similar. And so from the point of view of uh, 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 Islam, when they say they are submissive to God, it is, is it in effect being a slave of God. Now, this is um, a translation that you will see in Christianity as well. But in the eighth century, you have a rapid expansion of a new civilization and the new people were darker skinned than the Greco-Roman or Visigoths and the new social order was also polygynous and a new market developed. So our word slave comes from the Slavic root, which begins to hear first in English and in Europe around 1200. And so there was probably like four or five million enslaved Northern European persons who were moved to the South, to the Middle East and beyond into Asia during these early parts of the year. With Old Testament warrant from Deuteronomy. And if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. Now, I'm going to pause right here. This is the, the permission and the warrant by which you, you hear the expression of the Jubilee year. You also hear the expression of people who are being indentured for seven years. That figure comes from here, from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy. The permission would underwrite enslavement laws and protocols specifically across Christian nations in Europe, Britain, and the New World colonialist. So an indentured servant who would come across for seven years, the term comes here. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore, I command thee this thing today. One of my ethics classes, I talked to the, uh, the students about the economics of the Our Father. And you see it here that redemption is, a, is an economic word. If your mortgage is redeemed, it's an economic word. And here you go, that classic text of by the rivers of Babylon, which comes from the, the deportation and enslavement of the Israelites dating back to 597 before the common era. Uh, and it continued. And it wasn't until after the fall of Babylon that Cyrus the Great in 539, exiled Judeans were permitted to return to Judah. But so the metaphor, um, thousands of years old, has been re, re-given a life into a different situation. And so we see that metaphor constantly as we go through. If you're a Christian, here's where it gets really dicey because as a matter of fact, you call me master and Lord and you shall say, well, for so I am. I belong to the master who paid a great deal for me, great price for me. Um, Jesus is Lord, um, Lord and master, I think is the word, the phrase. The Greek word is doulos, douloi, slave. What does it really mean to call ourselves Christian? Well, let's take a look here at uh, some translations. Christian originary documents, uh, New Testament, the word servant is generally substituted for the word slave in English translations of the Bible, particularly the King James Version, and I don't quite understand always why. Uh, they, they were sensitive, James was sensitive around using the word, the, the Greek word, uh, slave, which it was. Um, Paul and Timothy, for example, he translates as servants of Christ Jesus when the word is slave of Christ. 
so that the definition of servant crosses paths with the word slave in a most interesting way. 14th and 15th centuries often used to render the Latin service as slave. And all the biblical translations from Wycliffe on to the revised in 1880, and even the modern standard, the word very often repre represents the Hebrew and the Greek dulos, which correspond to slave. We are slaves of Christ. Jesus is our Lord and master. Very quickly, here are, you see on two sides here, you have the Greek, the New American Standard, the King James Version, and the New Intellectual, the New, where is that one? So you have Duloi, slaves, servants, servants. Duloi, unworthy slaves, unprofitable servants. The King James Version here in Luke is interesting because it understands that even though they are servants, they are unprofitable. So it gives away the game. These are, these are enslaved persons. They're not servants. That's why they're unprofitable. And on the left, one of the great quotes from John's gospel, I no longer call you slaves. Of course, in, the, in the most translations of the King James, it's servants. I no longer call you servants because a master does not confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. So throughout its history, European, Asian, Eastern nations trafficked in enslaved persons for money and resources between 1500 and 1650. Eastern Europe, as we just saw, exported 1.5 million enslaved persons to North Africa, the Middle East, South Africa. The emerging empires of continental Europe made more than 54,000 voyages, 54,000 voyages in the soul of captive human beings and sent at least 10 to 12 million African nationals to the Americas. So the metaphor of enslavement is unfortunately common. You hear it all the time. I'm not even gonna try to use it here. The usage is thoughtless and pedestrian. Its practice implicates histories, it's implacable. Our religions uh, write it out, erase it. So the ongoing questions that I have through this and uh, the sequence that follows this is, what are the habits of mind? What are the social policies and conditions that make exploitation of persons enslavement, even genocide possible? And according to some apologists, inevitable. David Eltis, who was actually, who, who was the editor of the uh, transatlantic um, a slave trade uh, 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 database says almost all peoples have been slaves and slaveholders at some point in their histories. One such apologist that's, that's particular to American practice and should be better known and is crucial to US 20th century eugenics, immigration and race policing policies and that's why he's important. Madison Grant, The Passing of the Great Race in 1915. If you're a reader of Scott Fitzgerald and you read The Great Gatsby, you're going to come to a place where the kind of the bully of the bunch, Boyd Buchanan, refers to those kinds of people, the bucks among them, and he talks about that. Even, you know, that uh, Madison Grant's Passing of the Great Race talks about it. So Passing of the Great Race in 1915, 1920 was in common press. Uh, Grant writes, such beliefs have done damage in the past and it allows to go up and if allowed to go uncontradicted, may do more serious damage in the future. Thus the view that the Negro slave was an unfortunate cousin of the white man, deeply tanned by the tropic sun, denied the blessings of Christianity and civilization. This played no small part of the sentimentalists of the Civil War period. It has taken us 50 years to learn that speaking English, wearing good clothes and going to good schools and churches does not transform a Negro into a white man. Um, I'd like to apologize for the text. I will also tell you, you know, else where you can read that? Thomas Jefferson. And I don't get me started on this time because I have many opinions on Thomas Jefferson on, on uh, what we don't know about Thomas Jefferson, except to tell you this factoid that he mortgaged 150 enslaved persons to build Monticello. So, so we'll start, we'll start there. But his language here in polygenesis and his language here about the, the difference in races, um, actually he takes it from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was standard issue in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century with this. Scourge of slavery still claims 40 million victims worldwide must serve as a wake up call, the special repertoire on contemporary forms of slavery in the UN, 1619. 60% of those in forced labor, women, girls disproportionately affected, the female victims involved in forced labor 
98% experience sexual violence. Uh, and if you want to know where they locate the um, probably the center of much of this criminal activity, wait for that and see. Uh, this is a 1907 um, British sailor who was cutting uh, bonds off um, an enslaved person that they had freed from another boat, 1907. Global Slavery Index 2018. You want to know who makes your iPods and how, where you get your coffee from and where you get the uh, lithium chips for your phones and your cars? Um, little factoid, all five of the major U.S. American uh, chocolatiers uh, use coffee, uh, use chocolate from Ghana. Okay, to the point of this week. New study will show scope of illegal massage parlors, human trafficking in Atlanta. This, by the way, was written last year. The group behind the study says illegal massage parlors created the second highest form of human trafficking in the country. You recall uh, a few years ago, the New York Patriots owner, Robert Kraft, who was uh, arrested in a massage parlor in, I think it was Florida. And uh, he got away with it, but it was the women who were, it was the women who were arrested arrested on that. So before I move to section two, um, again, I'm throwing lots of information after I'm sure, I'm sure. but with, all, with regard to the always vexing proclamation of the humanity of Homo sapiens sapiens, which is the general species of the Homo. And we hear this, you know, always very self-flattering about how, how human we all are. The Smithsonian Human Origins Project tracks 17 species of Homo sapiens us, not the general ones. Noting that only one remains and that 16 of the species had, quote, been displaced, close quote. Part of what I'm tracking, and I, and I know that uh, there are different persons at unredact.com, for example. Miss um, Kennedy is also doing this kind of work with, a, uh, with different organizations, is how history is redacted, scrubbed, and washed. Displaced is the euphemistic word that curators use to explain the often violent processes by which only one of these species remains and by which the other 16 species just disappear. Very passive voice. I tell my students in class, passive voice lies and doesn't tell the truth. It hides the agent of the duo. You want a couple other expressions that are uh, euphemistic? Transatlantic slave trade is a one, as is the Middle Passage. We'll talk about that. Crown, cross, commodity, European nationalism, stolen lives, and the rubric of collective forgetting. From David Eltis again, Africa became the continent that supplied slaves to the world. First thing to, to get in mind, Africa and African is a colonizer's language. There are over 3,000 different ethnic groups speaking more than 21, 2,200 different language in, in the whole mainland of the Africans. And although the vast majority of native Africans can be considered to be indigenous in the sense that they have originated from that content, continent, nowhere else, and they identify as indigenous people, it's a modern application and it's much more restrictive. So my use will be to call these persons indigenous. The word Af African, by the way, as use, when it was used as early as the Romans, it meant the upper, uh, uh, above the Sahara, it usually meant places like Morocco and Tunisia. The, the concept of Africa as the whole continent, again, was only post-colonial use. Uh, so you see on the left here, what I would call, uh, uh, what they call the TNO map, a terrorist or, um, map of the world around the around globe. And you see that the, it's, it's aligned to a kind of Christian reading of the Old Testament in which the three sons, Salmon, Japheth, and Kam uh, of Noah are parceled out the three different countries. Cham uh, in Africa, because he had looked upon his father's nakedness in, uh, in Genesis, is, uh, is cursed, as Japheth, uh, the European, has been blessed. In 1503, the, the expression New World, which I still don't like to use, had not either been found, invented, or named. Amerigo Vespucci in 1503, Novus Mundo, he's writing to one of the Medici's in 1500, and he uses that. 
The expression first appears on Leonardo da Vinci's map in 1503, which is what you see here. This is America, right? Now, I like it that we always put America at the center of the world and other places over here. Uh, very quickly, the European traffic in stolen lives lasted uh, maybe 400 years, but many sub saharan trade routes survived for the better part of a millennium throughout here. And these are the routes in different places, Islam, the Berbers, um, many different kinds of civilizations and nations, including Africa themselves. And to glance at is that it was the endemic and nature of enslavement in African countries themselves that was the, the excuse for what we will later call the quote, scramble for Africa. Herodotus in the fifth century provides evidence of the already existing enslavement trade. So a general history of indigenous persons under various colonial room, uh, under various colonial regimes and the economics of enslavement. One commentator notes, it begins in the seventh century and survives today in Mauritania and Sudan. With the Islamic slave trade, we're talking 14 centuries rather than four. Um, the, the Western European countries will be here, generally speaking. So how does the West talk about this history? Made for social memory narratives, and I include most of our history books. Um, I did a recent thing on Washington, D.C., and it's, a, it's astonishing what is not said in our history books, but made for social memory narratives like museums, commonly scrubs to displace and evacuate the guilty persons as well as nations or to sentimentalize it. The middle passage, what happened to the two other passages? What happened to the passage in which the Europeans, Portuguese and Iberian and Spain for the, at first, and then the British and then the French and then the colonialists uh, came down to Africa and then what happened from the third passage, which is the, the location of goods, sugar and liquor and cotton mostly, from um, mostly the colonies in the Caribbean back to Spain and British. So in its broadest sense, the history of people now termed African-American is such a history. As I pointed out a moment ago, by the time the English colony of Virginia was founded in 1607, indigenous people of African descent had already been present in the Americas for over a century. Probably by first in 1625, the Spanish, for a lot of different reasons, had, had, had uh, Im imported captive indigenous from Africa into Florida. More than, the, um, by 1625, 475,000 enslaved had been bound over to the Spanish Americas and Brazil. Brazil, is, one rarely hears about, and I'll talk a bit more about that, more, more than the number of Africans who disembarked in British North America in the United States during the course of the entire European slave trade. So that figure of 475,000, uh, the African indigene who were brought directly to the States were about 475 to 500,000. Uh, they came, many more came in, of course, through other parts, but they're, they're, the colonials were very careful about how they were doing what they were doing under the cover of the night and really trying to bring anyone in uh, directly from um, the African. Uh, this map, for example, and you're gonna see various forms of maps like this, and I apologize, but each of the maps is useful for different things. This map, like others, erases the agency of the initial colonizing countries, Spain and Portugal, who opened the age of exploration. So you see here the Middle Passage. What you don't see are the slavers coming in this way what you don't see is the products the slavers want. Again, cotton, sugar, liquor, by the way, the largest manufacturer of, of liquor and sugar uh, was Rhode Island. So most of the colonies uh, shipping from the new world to, to Europe came out of Rhode Island, not the South. But the late 1700s, Britain was the largest dealer in the stolen lives of African indigenous persons. In order of trade, Portuguese, British, colonials as well, the French, Spanish, and the Dutch empires. Current estimates, 12 million to 12.8 million Africans indigene were shipped across the Atlantic over a period of 400 years. I apologize for the numbers. Numbers are persons. 
And it, it can seem overwhelming when one begins to think about this and why one, why I, for example, I use the word genocide in a, I think a continually appropriate way. And while, why the histories are, are scrubbed of this in such a way that this simply becomes an economic transaction. The numbers purchased by traders was considerably higher, but the passage had a high death rate with probably 20% persons dying during the voyage. And as we saw in my first slide, many numbers of them simply thrown overboard, like you throw cattle when they run out of water and, and no charges were ever brought. And many more would die, quote, in seasoning camps, whatever they are in the Caribbean. Uh, you don't see the U.S. in here except right here. And again, their figure here is 377,000. This is direct. But again, the colonials are part of this too. So very quickly, a timeline. 1444, uh, remember now Columbus is 1492, and this is the number we always hear, 1492, 1492. Portugal in 1444 basically has the first ship of um, enslaved Africans kind of by accident, but that's when it started. And later 1497 through 1500, you begin to find the Portuguese influence around Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, Brazil and, and, and Provincetown, should you be, be familiar with that area. Um, Spain, you have 1492, entire Caribbean, uh, settled only the larger islands of Hispanolia, 1493, Puerto Rico, Jamaica. Um, the British took Jamaica in 1555. So what you're seeing here is a, is a real scramble for islands and it's all about trade. Francis Drake and Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and Francis Drake will be the first echo of what we begin to see of the Royal Crown's involvement in this and that may, uh, is, is getting uncomfortable and it, it should. Um, and I'll say it right now that one of the reasons that the UK has kind of gotten off a little bit easy on uh, on dealing with its colonial powers because the, the coloniality was always these islands someplace far away. Um, the United States, um, we, we are living in the situation that we have made it, permitted to make. And so we have to deal with it here in a way that the UK um, until now has been able to um, avoid. British colonization in Bermuda began in 1612 when I, I started school in Bermuda school just for, just for sharing. Um, the British uh, occupied Jamaica in 1655, and you should know that the son of William Penn, who founded the colony of peace called Pennsylvania, um, John Penn, was the co colonialist who basically conquered Jamaica. James of York, James II, Royal African Company, you'll hear more about him in a few minutes, probably the leading source of enslaved persons into the New World and then back to the colonies of the product. Again, so the map, I, this map here is simply so that you can see um, what's very often not paid attention to is this area down in here. So that much, 60% of the enslavement for 300 years aimed at South America um, and Britain, not Britain, sorry, and Brazil. Um, you see if a few slave, enslaved persons would return to, um, turn to Europe you see um, much more going into these different countries and you'll see a larger map here. Very few went to Charleston and to New York and, and uh, New Orleans by themselves. Uh, again, the map, what's important here about this map is just so that you can, Angola, the Congo Republic, Cameroon, Nigeria, Togo, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Guinea. By the way, you wonder where the coin Guinea came from? Well, here you have it. Uh, that's also uh, James II, King York. Senegal, Gambia. Sierra Leone, Liberia, just so that we have a sense that these are real countries, real nations, uh, real persons, and wh whatever happened here uh, to the persons who were transported here uh, affects these persons as well. Portugal very quickly began all of this in 1444 with Prince Henry the Navigator. Um, they were the ones who probably first went around the, uh, the bottom end of South America um, this is uh, the, again, the, the position of the church. Portuguese were pretty pious people in the sense that they were the ones who, even more than anybody else, declared that it was their point basically to, to colonize persons, basically to return them to God. They have warned from this from the Vatican, as you'll see. 
what's significant about here is that that, that he's he's meeting um, uh, the the, the indigene in Elmina, which is where you're going to see uh, the Portugal um, infamous uh, enslavement castle on the coast of Ghana. And this is where here you're talking about San Tome was a small island right about here. Um, they practiced and, man and, fi and figured out and developed the manufacturing for sugar, which is what then gradually became the model used over all five empires. You see British and French and Dutch and Portuguese and Danish up and down. And by the way, any of these maps, again, any of this information is easily found. Um, I have nothing here to me is new. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm telling narratives that are not my own. Um, but any of this information, and there are very good books on it, um, we, you can have it and easily find. But when you put it together, it has a certain punch. Again, here's the map, I, 1444. 82 years later, in 1526, Spanish explorers had brought the first enslaved slaves to settlements of what would become the United States. Uh, the first Portuguese settlement in Brazil, 1516, they received more indigenous African slaves than any other country. 4.9 million from Africa brought to Brazil between 1501 and 1866. Um, you could just draw a line right through here. You have Europe, British, French, Dutch, Spain, Brazil. So uh, you, you begin to see here first, it's the Spanish Americas that start. And by Spanish, by Spanish it's the Iberian, which is Portuguese and Spanish. It is, but when the, when the British take over, where the British, hello, when the British begin to take over. And by that, that's the colonists. And that is from the year 1626. So for the first 25 or 30 years, this was largely a, a, a Iberian adventure. And actually it's, it's probably for the first 150 years from 1450 through to, to 1500 and uh, 1600. God, Christianity and colonialism often closely associated with and Pope Nicholas in 1514, 52 authorizes Portugal to quote, reduce any Saracens, Muslims, and pagans and any other unbelievers to perpetual slavery. This is in the text, um, bad Latin. Pope Nicholas later writes, three years later, to the same king, along with sanctifying the seizure of non-Christian lands. These documents authorized the enslavement of native non-Christian peoples and Africa in colonized countries. Um, later we'll see that they, they renege on this because they want to bring Africans in, but they don't want Africans who have been in from Muslim countries because they think that uh, Islam will contaminate the Christianity. So, legally grants, if you can call that, Portugal the right to enslave any and all people they encounter on the coast of the Western Sahara. Midway through the bull, the Pope declares sub-Saharan Africans to be held in perpetual slavery. Moving ahead, you know, and this is again, the four year, this is six months after um, Columbus. Quote, among other works, well pleasing to the divine majesty, dot, 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 that the health of souls be cared for and that barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to the faith itself. Six months after the landing of Columbus, um, the map here is a German map, and it shows uh, South America, Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch. Largely, the Portuguese became here, took out over here. It gets a little difficult now here if you have a devotion to, um, to Columbus. So from 1454 to 1494, with continuing war for pressure from popes and imperial and commercial voices, other countries, Dutch, British, Portuguese, French, Spanish, begin to join in here. Portugal, Spain, you begin to see up here, the, the, uh, the colonials. Beginning with 1492, Spain gains control over more territory for the three centuries. So one consequence, the indigenous population plummeted by 80% in the first century following Columbus's voyages primarily through the spread of diseases, 
forced labor and enslavement for Spanish immigrants. Um, and uh, in the other slavery, Resendez argues that it is more the enslavement rather than the spread of disease that we, we worked with that. And we can talk about that. So Hispanola in 1492, where Columbus lands, serves as an incentive. He lands later on the island of Cuba. And from there, he learns that of the island just south of them, Jaima, Jamaica. So here it goes in 1492, 1494. Um, part of the rubric here of the representation, you will always see this, because this was examined the excuse and the model for which has happened. So here you have the indigenous meeting the armed um, conquistadors, and you see them bringing their gifts. This is that from the, the narrative of First and Canada. So Columbus lands six months after Alexander's papal decree. He takes the Pope at his word to overthrow the barbarous nations. Columbus legacy, genocide. It's a reason October 12th is now the Feast of the Indigenous People. 70 to 100 million people indigenous killed by Europeans over the time and the detainment within a generation, five to 10% of the entire island's indigenous population remained. Um, this is information and detail that can be easily found if you need it. Um, the images on the left and the right, you see these were put together by, uh, there's a, there was a Benedictine priest who saw this and was, was uh, quite appalled. And so he put together a, a narrative, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, uh, he, he sent back notes to the bishops and to the king with a description. And here you see uh, a, a soldier cutting off the arm of an indigenous person who, because they didn't bring him gold. Here you see the indigenous, indigenous being attacked by dogs by the Spain. The various peoples Columbus decimated on Hispanolia, now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, we're not Indians, but Tainos. Within 60 years, only a few hundred were left. And it's hard to underestimate uh, the avarice. And in Columbus's own journal, he says, um, baptize them or kill them, basically. And he, he wanted gold from them. When he couldn't get gold from them, he threatened and did, as you're seeing here in these images. Uh, over here, you see attacks from dogs. You see, again, the issues this was the, the same picture that you saw before. Tainos were brutally murdered as sport in a brief account by de las Casas in Destruction of the Indians, written in 1539. He describes Spanish settlers competing to see if they could cut off a Taino's head in one stroke. I'm sorry, this is so graphic. Settlers often hunted the Tainos with dogs and allowed their dogs to tear the victims apart. Um, well, I'll, I'll say for any opinion. 1492, Columbus, again, this is his journal. With 50 men, we could subjugate them and make them do whatever we want. As soon as I arrived in the Indies on the first island which I found, Hispanola, I took some of the natives by force in order that they might learn and might give me information of whatever gold there is in these parts. Let us in the name of the Holy Trinity go on selling all the slaves that can be sold. Um, Columbus's own son, Fernando, or Hernando, as he was called, again writes, many of these red men, women, and children were roasted on spits. The invaders hacked the children to pieces. Columbus's men would make bets as to who would slit a man in two or cut off his head at one blow. All right, I'm not going to read that whole thing. One gets the point. Um, there was no gold in 1492 nor 1495, and so Columbus returned to Spain with five boatloads of, 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 of uh, indigene, which again was the first uh, enslavement from the quote new world into the old world. Um, in 1519, from 1501, Spanish conquistadors began to move into different areas. They landed in Mexico. Um, and Herman, Hernan Cortez arrived in Tenochtitlan on 8th of November, 1519. Uh, it's, it's not clear what happened, but they're not precise numbers. The city's population was probably, was certainly five times larger than London was at the time, was as large as Madrid or Paris. I mean, it was, a, it was one of the largest cities of the world at the time. Within two years, Cortez and his men had either slaughtered or, or killed. And with the help of indigene, 
in the area taken over. Um, for 1951 mural by Diego Rivera in the National Palace, you see Eric again, the standard image that accompanied any enslavement by the Spanish, the requisite cross. And here you begin to see the, the, the enslaved, you see the different persons doing the, both uh, uh, church uh, and, uh, and also civil. This is in the National Palace still. Nuevo Mexico, New Spain. Uh, the 1531 uh, Codex, a legal document, it entered into a case against the colonial power of New Spain, this area here, uh, suggesting that that, uh, that they were so cruel to the Indians that they, they managed to bring suit to the, to the king. Uh, and this particular Codex, which, which was a, it's a basically a drawing, shows eight men and 12 women were being given to the Spanish in tribute along with dry goods and other materials and you have the, you, here you have the Maria, you have a statue of, of Mary, which is interesting at the time, 1525, that even then the Christian effect had been at, at its hold. Um, the other slavery by uh, Rodezan argues that there was a different kind of slavery. Rodezan predated and outlisted the African slaves. So the other slavery shapes the shared history of Mexico and later the United States. The encomienda, which is something like what we would call the servitude that would be part of uh, you want to, uh, in, indentured crop sharing or different sorts of ways, um, uh, some kind of model by which the, the, the encomendero would take care of the enslaved person, but they would do the work for him. Uh, this is on Esteban del Rey, a como pueblo in the chapel uh, there today, as in current. And the irony here is this is Acoma and probably the, the longest inhabited um, space in the, uh, the New World. Uh, Saint Esteban del Rey, the Spanish uh, massacred the natives here in 1599, just massacred them, uh, trapped them, tricked them, massacred them all, took over. Saint Esteban del Rey, they named the Pueblo uh, after a Hungarian state rather than any kind of other person. When um, I talked to one of the women who was kind of doing a, a tour of the, of the Pueblo, I had pointed out the, what looked rather harsh in terms of the, the real graphics on the walls. And she says, these are the Spanish burning in hell for what they have done to my people. An unexpected response to Spanish practices of cruelty shared by other colonizers uh, brings us really to the topic that probably most of us are familiar with, enslavement of African indigene. Following the indigene Taino's near decimation from forced labor, disease and war, the Spanish under advisement of uh, Bartolomeo de Casas with the blessing of the Catholic church began engaging in earnest the kidnapped and forced labor of enslaved Africans. Sorry to put it that way, but that the, it was the church's rather pious sense of, and you see this if you remember the film, The Mission, and basically the, 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 the cardinal, the Jesuit cardinal basically closes down the mission because of, the, the, of what he's seeing there. But they're saying that, that these, are our, these are our, basically our people and we can't be hurting them like this. And uh, so we need to get somebody else to do our work for us. During the French colonial period, 1625, Haiti was based on slavery, the economy, and practice there was the most brutal in the world. Again, we saw this earlier, um, an illustration of Spanish cruelty from an edition, um, and this was back in 1650. I don't need to, I don't need to belabor that. What, what if, if you have lawyers present or people interested in human rights, probably the first international human rights conference was 1550, 1551, the Valladolid, the Valladolid, debate, which was probably the first time and probably the last that a colonizing nation, nation organized a formal inquiry into the justice of the methods used to extend its empire. And it was for the, certainly for the first time that race-based enslavement as, as the thing itself, that specifying a, a specific race or gender to the enslaved was called into question. 
So the Spanish empire would, would expand over the Caribbean, half of South America, most of Central America, much of North America. Other nations would continue the plunder. And you see here in the 1775 uh, uh, diary from the West Indies, um, very placid servants, boats, So now here's where it gets a little bit more current in the sense that um, we don't hear much of, a, of, of Spanish uh, um, colonialism or even post-colonialism right now. This is England, the United Kingdom, the Stuarts, New York, the Crown, the Tudors, what Harry and Meghan said, hold tight. Very quickly, Britain was the most successful, and Britain, by the way, is the English first and then it became Britain in 1807 was one of the most successful slave trade, uh, 1707, was one of the most successful slave trading countries. Together with Portugal, the two countries counted for 70% of all indigenous transported to the Americas. Britain was most dominant between 1640 and 1807. Estimated that Britain transported 3.1 million Africans of whom 2.7 million arrived to the British colonies in the Caribbean North and South America and to other countries. Again, my point, why is nothing more made of this or has not been made of this? Partly because to the UK, this is all, well, those are just little islands. You know, uh, Prince Charles, who may or may not be king one day, said very recently, oh, what a great debt of dat attitude, uh, gratitude we owe to the peoples of the Caribbean. Well, that's a nice way of putting it, perhaps. Uh, as one, one uh, commentator writes, Britain was not only foremost slave trading country, she had become the honorable slave carriers of her rivals. Uh, long conversation on this is that she became kind of the Uber for persons who did not have the boats themselves. Um, English, English here, colonizers preparing for future enslavement from early on. Uh, in the East African and the East Indian uh, societies, you, hear, you see here, the first example of what I would call uh, chattel or cattle, the beginnings of the, fam of the factory animal processing system. And this is back to 1600 on the other side of the world. Um, Elizabeth I, they talk about uh, the Virgin Queen and what a triumphant time in England it was. The history of the crown and enslavement begins in and about the year 1560, fully 100 years before the colonization of Jamaica, or after, uh, 100 years after the colonization of Jamaica. Elizabeth, fifth, sorry, before the colonization of Jamaica. Elizabeth I commissioned John Hawkins and a slave ship named Jesus of Lubbock, Lubbock being a town in Germany where the ship was made. If you know the tune, we will wait till Jesus come to carry our loved ones home that refers to this. This was the first venture by the Crown, British government, or English government, into this kind of trade. Although these were the, these were the same years that gave us our first colonies on the East Coast, uh, Raleigh and uh, Coatan and North Carolina and um, the various uh, trips by uh, Walter Raleigh. Hawkins is a cousin of Sir Francis Drake. And on his first voyage to the Caribbean, he stops off near Sierra Leone in West Africa, where his crew violently hijacks a Portuguese slave trip. They seized 300 enslaved Africans, so not only are the Africans kidnapped themselves, they're then stolen and resold to plantation owners in the Caribbean. The English had made their first foray into the trade and kidnapped Africans. By 1715, they would come to dominate them. Uh, were the English unhappy with this? This is Hawkins seal given to him by Queen Elizabeth. You see the crown, you see the coins, and you see the bound African enslaved on his coat of arms. Water carrying, carrying water for the enemy. What museums remember and what they're paid to forget. This is called the slave trade. This is what you see in the National Portrait Gallery. My husband, Tim, and I go there often and we walk up and down the aisles and and we, looking, if you get into the American wing and you see a, a, a variety of persons of color and black Americans who are basically the persons who are the docents and who stand and, and watch things, 
and you look around at what they're looking at and what they're what they are seeing i'm saying what must people think to see this and um this is what you receive the slave trade nothing about the persons enslaved but about uh john hawkins this is the text queen elizabeth approved and funded hawkins journey during which he captured 300 africans this is the text Meanwhile, the African presence in England became established to such an extent that attempts were made to limit their numbers. Queen Elizabeth enjoyed the profits of the Atlantic slave trade and employed African entertainers in her court, but she issued a decree to expel Africans from England in July, 1596. This is the National Gallery, National Portrait Gallery. Here's where it gets fun, maybe, not fun. Um, Duke Dutch settlers named the lower part of the island New Amsterdam in 1624. When the English seized the land in 1664, they renamed it New York. Now, 1664, this is 100 years before the, the colonies um, resist the government. In 1664, they renamed it New York in honor of the Duke of York. The Duke of York, the brother of Charles II, who had been reinstated after Oliver Cromwell. So if you get your dates right here. Um, and also, this, by the way, is 1500-1664. Through the Carmelian period, the, 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 the persons who were captured in Ireland during the British overtaking of Ireland were sent to the new colonies themselves as enslaved persons. You can look it up. Um, they renamed it New York in honor of a Duke. He becomes James II of England and James VII of Scotland. He creates Britain's greatest slave empire, known as the Royal African Company, which transported between 90 and 100,000 indigenous Africans to the Caribbean and American colonies between 1672 and 1689. Here, a small map that you'll see again, uh, the New York slave auction market, 1700. The guinea with uh, James's picture on it and his coat on the back. And you wonder where the expression guinea comes from. This is a gold coin. Came from Guinea where they got the gold. Uh, the Royal African Company is in fact known as the Guinea Company. You know, and we, t we, we talk somewhat humorously about the, the firm, the, 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 the royal family and the firm. It really is, and it has been, and you, and there's no apology on anyone's part when you start reading this about it. It's, it's actually a business. In this 1672 proclamation, you see the top portion offering to supply colonists with, with quote, Negroes at set prices, H.R.H. James, Duke of York and the Royal African Company, 1672, 100 years before the cessation of uh, the colonies from um, Britain, which had a monopoly on the slave trade, quote, to all his majesty's subjects, and especially those to those inhabiting the plantations in America. Now we're gonna see this particular seal in a moment. Um, elephant bearing a castle, should be obvious, African and um, kind of a British castle, flanked by two bound enslaved men. This is Duke of York who later became Charles II. Surrounding the figure is the company's motto, and I won't give you the Latin, but it's by royal patronage, commerce flourishes. And again, people are so astonished at all this. You could look it up, you can find all this. So here again, it gets, it gets uh, uncomfortable, more uncomfortable. The former base of the Royal African Trading Company, and you guessed it, is Wall Street, Wall and Walter Streets. If you looked up the law in 1711, the New York Enslavement Law of 1711, it lays out in specific detail where enslaved persons are to be brought. The reason I don't have a slide here because I, I didn't want to try to take time away from it. Where slaves are to be brought who are to be rented or people know to go to find them. 1711, an act for the, for the better distribution of the, of, the, of the New York slaves. In the late 1700s, New York City was second only to Charleston, the name will be important, South Carolina for the busiest slave market and could boast that more than 20% of its population were slaves. Again, the myth that this is a Southern problem. Late 1700s.
Okay, in 1991, during a construction of an office building at 290 Broadway for a federal building, um, they uncover what was originally this, the burial ground of uh, probably between 15 and 20,000 persons. It becomes a landmark later in 1993, a national monument in 2007 called the African Burial Ground. So there were 419 here. I, I'm not gonna labor on this because again, it's, it's, it's not pleasant viewing. They opened up the grounds that they could see and these are different. You can see, you know, adult, child, adult, child. Um, you can, this guy is still at it, okay. These were hand um, made coffins brought in from Ghana. There were seven of them. So if you go to downtown to the business district and see the monument, here you'll see these, along with the actual monument of the African burial ground, you see where they have reburied 419 persons in these seven coffins. Charles II, AKA Duke of York, actually has two cities named in his memory and honor. Considering that he was one of the most avaricious and active enslavers in royal and Britain history, and he was because he had the power as king to do it, the city, given its subsequent history in enslavement, Charleston, shouldn't be a surprise. 1684, an act to incorporate Charlestown. Now wait for it, there's a surprise here too, because we'll see that in a moment. So after the Stuarts, in the 30 years prior to the colonial uprising in 1740, Queen Anne, she owns 22% of the shares of the Royal African Company, a fifth of the British slave market. When she dies, King George becomes king. He's not happy with just a fifth. So he increases his shareholding, makes himself governor. He's the king. A business which transported 64,000 slaves to America in 15 or so years. George III, now again, this brings up to our history, George III, is the monarch that the Declaration of Independence is written to. George III would carry on with the firm's business. And you may remember that he, he was accused by a slightly hypocritical Thomas Jefferson of quote, waging cruel war against human nature itself. But Jefferson and the King may have something in common as we shall see in a moment. English and British monarchs directly implicated in enslavement personally and as a function of the role in government. Elizabeth, who remarked to one of her advisors that she hoped that the Africans who were being uh, taken captive, that, that they had, had wanted to do it by themselves, had wanted themselves to do it. That is to say that they wanted to do it and go. Oliver Cromwell, sending Irish. Charles II, then his brother, James, who then became uh, Charles, and then his brother who becomes James, then Anne, then George's one, two, and three, four, and five, all the way up to 1837. The surprise here is that Queen Charlotte in 1762, that George III has this kind of very surprising marriage to, and George III was German, He's a, he was a Habsburg, he couldn't speak English, and never did. Um, he, his, he marries someone, again, a, quote, a, a, a German, a woman um, that was probably black, Queen Charlotte. And the town of Charlotte, North Carolina is named after her. But this is Bridgerton. So if you want something else to watch, this is on Netflix. So it's, this is a quote from an article called Throne of Blood. It's time for the British royal family to make amends for centuries of profiting from slavery. And it's a larger question as I began with, because is, is money reparative or restorative? And simply throwing money at something, what well, might be important, um, is, is a way I think to deflect from other sorts of things. The article goes on, one institution has remained silent, the British monarchy. Still it's no secret of the history that the British royal family is intertwined with slavery. Okay. The Royal African Company of England shipped more than enslaved women men and children to the Americas than any other single institution during the entire period. Just to kind of a pause, um, 
we talk about redacting histories and we talk about reclaiming histories, we talk about revising histories, we talk about voices that were hidden. Um, and while you saw the, the poignant and sad and, and, and awfulness of, of bones and bodies dumped together and, and you know, we've seen this with Holocaust burials, we've seen with all kinds of sorts of situations, that persons who are nameless as persons have value as commodities, precisely because slaves were reduced to property that they appear so regularly. They don't have tombstones, they don't have people mourning for them, but what they do have are historic documents and wills um, and ledger books, as we'll see, both in the US and Britain. Property as property, slaves were listed in plantation accounts and itemized in inventories. Few historical documents cut to the reality of slavery more than lists of names written alongside monetary values. So common was it that they had pre-printed receipts for the purchase of a Negro fill in the blanks. In very much the same way that in Birmingham, Alabama, they had pre-made uh, uh, tax, uh, tax uh, write-offs, tax things where you would basically uh, tax poll pull taxes. Um, but, so the, finally it ends in 1807 by Britain and um, while there's a lot of self applause around that, remember that the United States, uh, Thomas Jefferson had, had ended the international slave trade in 1808, which again, just to, to, to fill in the blank over here, they could do, they could, ab, they could abolish the international trade because as a matter of fact, as Jefferson knew, he was gaining 4% interest on all of his breeding slaves. I'm sorry to say it that way, that's what he says, and you can look at his own journal. So that the, in the United States, that they could end the, the traffic in, in, in international enslavement because domestically they were producing enough enslavement from their own, quote, product. I'm sorry to put it that way. By the 19th century in Britain and in Europe, the slave trade in the minds of major European powers, quote, had, again, inconsistent with other economic pursuits. So even in the United States, and you, you hear a lot of uh, chatter about the abolitionists uh, in the North. Well, the, the, the North were finding that it really wasn't a, a profit to them other than places like Rhode Island and, and some places in Massachusetts. But there, while separate was equal still through the turn of the 20th century in the North, and while the laws, anti-Black laws governed free and enslaved persons in the North were just as vicious as the South, um, the voice of abolitionists in the North because there was really no, they, they didn't have any use for these. They didn't have the kind of property plantation ground that the, the Southern plantations had. So we're coming to an end here. You may have to give me five or 10 minutes extra here, but I'll try and do this. So the basic economic and political facts of the European developing colonial practices of genocide. One, in the history of the national slave trade, 1525, and that's the first time that, uh, again, the Spanish bring uh, indigenous Africans into Florida through 1866, at the end of our, our civil war, war between the states, civil war. 12 point million indigenous Africans are kidnapped. 20% do not survive to various points, ports, and Americans. The remaining 10.7 million who survived this horror, they disembarked in the Caribbean, South America. From these points, introduced north into the colonies. 500,000 captive children and women and men are brought directly to mainland colonies in the US. And you know where they land? Charleston, of course, in the slave market, which even today is all gusted up. And, and, and so we're in the business now of funding memorials for enslavement. And my question is, is um, are memorials trophies or what are we, uh, what's happening and who's celebrating this? Children typically comprise 26% or more of a slave's cargo. On average, the voyage took two months, maybe four months. And by the way, uh, you know, Chanel Hall in Boston was also the philanthropist and major slave owner. To quote back to Karl Marx again, the turning of Africa into Warren for the commercial hunting of black skins signaled the rosy dawn of the era of capitalist production. In Marx, uh, rosy dawn, you clearly hear his irony here. Um, Milana Karinga, whom we know, may know as the kind of the founder of uh, Kwanzaa, he writes, the morally monstrous destruction of human possibility involving redefining African humanity to the world, poisoning past, present, 
and future relations with others who only know us through the stereotyping and thus damaging the truly human relations among people today. The question of the narrative is important and who's telling the story and what story is being told and for what profit. A little bit here on capitalism and slavery and Eric Williams himself, a uh, black Caribbean Jamaican is, uh, he was the first uh, the, the first uh, prime minister of, uh, what, was that? what was the country? But, but he writes probably the, the most significant book on capitalism and slavery. And he points out that in order to understand the brutality of American capitalism, you have to start on the plantation. Cotton planters, millers, and consumers were fashioned on a new economy. Field houses of Georgia, Alabama, cotton houses, slave auction blocks. In other words, they're breathing a capitalist economy and the beating heart was enslavement. The daily record of cotton picked. This is where we get our double booking accounting. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, name. In the decades between the American Revolution and the Civil War, slavery as a source of cotton that fed Rhode Island's mills, its liquor mills, its manufacturing mills, as a source of the wealth that filled New York's banks, as a source of the markets that inspired Massachusetts manufacturers, proved indispensable to national economic development. And I point out again that, uh, again, Jefferson's uh, mortgaging of 150 of his enslaved persons, and by the way, he owned 600 over his life, uh, he mortgaged 150 of them with the help of a uh, New York bank for the building of, of Monticello. And so there's still more, and we're coming to a close here. Uh, a consequence of the Berlin Conference in 1884, the partitioning of Africa, once, once Europe had gotten on the kind of the, the agreement that slavery was wrong and slavery was wrong, they decided that slavery everywhere was wrong. And so the first place they had to look was, of course, was Africa itself, which it still had, had this indigenous system of network of economy of enslavement. And so in 1884, they had the Berlin Conference for, quote, the partitioning of Africa. That is to say, in 1880 to 1913, um, European countries had occupied pretty much most of the African continent with the excuse that they were doing this in order to end the enslaved trade, as we saw earlier in that first slave market. Um, but that the scramble for Africa, it was covered by the notion of that we're gonna do this in order to end slavery. By 1914, Europeans uh, are said to have occupied as much as 85% of the globe as colonies, protectorates, dependencies, dominions, commonwealths. Also during this period that racism was the most scientific, European and American intellectuals offering quote, proofs of their own innate superiority, ranging from social Darwinism to the measurement of head size. And again, this is language that's building on Thomas Jefferson. You can see it in his notes in Virginia. And in addition, you have a self-serving pseudoscience, these pretensions to superiority in which we're gonna go down now and convert the Africans away from slavery and enslavement. They said they have that kind of that moral dimension most famously encapsulated by the idea of the white man's burden. Now, the following images are not pleasant. There's three of them. This is the white man's burden. An empire built on blood and bodies ruled by sadism and whim. Leopold II, the second king of Belgium, 1865 to 1909, and through his own efforts, the owner and absolute ruler of the Congo Free State from 1885 to 1908. I should just read these. You'll go to interpret the gospel in the way it will be best to protect your interest in that part of the world. You go certainly to evangelize, but your evangelization must inspire above all Belgian interests. Your principal objective and ambition in the Congo is never to teach the Negroes to know God. This is what they knew already. Apologize for using that word, this is the text evangelizing the niggers so that they may stay in submission to the white colonialists, so they never revolt against their estates they undergo on. Okay, you see it. Now, the images, these are hands that are cut off by the colonialists for the indigenous of the Congo not doing their work. 
This is the image of a man's child, daughter, whose hands and foot were chopped off because of his failure to do the work. In the left, Voltaire and Candide in 1759, very early says, this is what costs for you to eat your sugar in your life. And I, again, I apologize for some of the graphicness of this. Um, Richard Kipling, writing about the United States, the United States and the Philippines in 1899. Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captive's need. To wait in heavy harness, unfluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. We wonder why, or some people wonder why Game of Thrones was so popular. It feeds our fantasy still in our post-colonial era. A few more minutes, thank you. A recent 2020 in The Guardian, um, a journal which I respect, the case for British slavery reparations can no longer be brushed aside. The pattern is clear. Reparations have been paid to those who profited from African enslavement rather than those who were enslaved, as happened in DC when DC passed its emancipation with compensation. Uh, the owners of the enslaved were, were, were paid money. The enslaved never are. Harry and Meghan call for Britain to confront the colonial past. Uh, even at the same time that they have Ghana's, the castle of Elmina, the slave castle fort on one of their stamps. So this is what they said at, to the Queen's Commonwealth Trust in their early June, right after the murder of uh, George Floyd. This is uh, Prince Harry. Quote, when it comes to institutional and systematic racism, it's there and it stays there because someone somewhere is benefiting from it. I'm gonna pause here because probably his own past suggests that until he met his current wife, uh, Duchess uh, Megan, uh, he, he probably didn't know that himself. We can't deny or ignore the fact that all of us have been educated to see the world differently. However, once you start to realize that there is, no, there is that bias there, then you need to acknowledge it. You need to do the work to become more aware so that you can help stand up for something that is as wrong and should not be acceptable in our society today. Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex. It's not just in the big moments, it's in the quiet moments where racism and unconscious bias lies and rest. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are president and vice president respectively of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust and was uh, at that meeting in June, as in Zoom, that they addressed this. This is another issue about a different paper. 14 Caribbean nations sue Britain, Holland, and France for slavery reparations that could cost hundreds of billions of pounds. Countries demanding compensation for awful legacy of alter about the Atlantic trade. Britain compensated slave owners 20 million pounds in 1834 equal to 20 billion pounds today. Idea of reparations in the US have often surfaced, but none have been paid. Again, the, the, the larger issue here is, is, is can, we, can we throw money at something like this? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm of the sense that we can't. Uh, whatever that something, I'm not of the sense, but I don't think we can. Whatever part money might play in, in reparative justice, it needs to be an issue of restorative justice. Um, the United Nations Apology for the Slave Trade in 205 discusses different aspects of reparations and inc that includes apologies, the right to know the truth, financial compensation. Uh, and you, you know, you see very often now in terms of uh, in a court, you'll see that the, the victim gets to speak her or his situation. Largely this is coming back to this notion of restorative justice. Apologies, a truth commission on the transatlantic trade said Symbolic financial compensation will not solve the problems of the continual underdevelopment in the present of a country. Six states that apologize for slavery, Alabama, Florida, Maryland, North Carolina, New Jersey, and Virginia.
the subtext here. 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, 60 years of separate but equal, 35 years of, of racist housing policy, until we reckon with our compounding moral debts, America will never be whole. Uh, this article is a um, is signal. Um, Mr. Coates spoke at Congress about uh, for HR 40, which is even right now in, in Congress about restorations. And HR 40, and it's called HR 40, uh, referring to the, to, to the 40 acres that was promised um, by the federal government in, 16, six, in, in 1865 as reparations, which no one ever got. I'm ending here with uh, kind of an overview. This is 1482, this is Elmina Castle. Uh, it's, a, it's the earliest built castle by Portugal in, um, in Ghana. And it has remained as, a, as enslaved. It's the last place that the enslaved would see. And it's also, as I said, on the right you have Elmina, and on the right you have Charleston, the slave mark. One erected in 1482 and one um, 1684, named after a, a royal king. As, as I'm concluding here, what I call an empire of blood and the, the scramble for the Caribbean, much of uh, the questions that I had at the beginning in terms of whose narrative is this, who benefits? So there, it's one thing to retell this as somebody who sees from within a kind of history like Harry, that, that I myself as speaker am implicated in making a kind of a presentation like this, as so all those of us are who are listening. And where we go with that as we, as we conclude, um, all of this information is available through various numbers of places. And um, Mr. Kelman can give you my contact information and we can have a conversation about this. Um, but it is true that the work we do, it's called Gandhi, however insignificant and however small, we must do, whether we are telling the narrative, if we're going to work to bend the arc of justice even more, the work is gonna start here with what we do. And the narrative that we do here and we take here, we take out elsewhere. The image on the right, poignant uh, reburial of, of African indigenous remains found in Albany, New York. Who lives and who dies? Who holds on to our lives? Time and time and time again. Will they tell your story in the end? Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? Well, I don't think that this is going to play, and I apologize for that. You may know it from uh, Hamilton. It was, um, these are the lyrics that, that, that Common and, and Mikhail are singing. Here are some sources. The Transatlantic Slave Trade Project documentary, Slave and Remembrance, UN Documents Remembering Slavery, uh, Harvard's Hutchins Center, and I'm happy to give anyone a, a commentary. And again, I want to thank you for, for being part of the, of the project this afternoon. Um, and I really apologize that there is so much to try and talk about in 45 minutes to, to an hour and a half. Uh, but I do, if you find something of specific uh, import and meaning to you or your life, whether on whatever side of uh, the, the, the narrative you stand, um, take it and make it your own, learn from it and with it and, and pass it forward. And um, any of the errors that might be in part of this or mine and the history itself is ours. Thank you. Awesome. Ed, thank you. That was fabulous. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. This is Audrey Lord. What are the words you do not yet have? What do you need to say? What are the tyrannies you swallow day by day and attempt to make your own until you will sicken and die of them, still in silence? Robert, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone.
next week or in a couple of weeks, uh, Robert, it will be, I'm, I'm going to be doing specifically on Anglo-American, Anglo-colonial enslavement practice. And I'm not yeah, gonna so that. Ed and I need to figure out when we're going to um, schedule the next one. As soon as we do that, um, we'll send out the information on that. And there were quite a few questions that came in, Ed, if you have a little bit of time. I have all kinds of time. Go ahead. Some, some serious, some less so. So, so the first one, not quite... Um, uh, it was someone asked quite a few people actually what was the name of the song um that you played and does it have any meaning and someone um chimed in they thought it was rivers of babylon right it is it's, it's the original it's the original version by the melodians of rivers of babylon in 18 uh, and it went on from there to become a, a jamaican cult cult text and bob marley they then we used it but it's the melodians version and they were the first ones in 18 uh, 1967. asked this early on and you did talk about this but maybe you can elaborate a little bit um they asked do you feel the current emphasis on 1619 detracts from the bigger act or the bigger arc sorry of history of african slavery by europeans it bends it it obscures part of it there's another question came in um i'm going to kind of paraphrase it. and if i can say robert uh, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is, and you can see this in a number of different places, including the UN, from 1525, from, uh, sorry, from 1495 until 1625, there was a 125 year period of enslaved history. What about as far as um, recognizing the role that countries play and kind of acknowledging the role? Is there anything different about how that takes place in the United States versus say other countries like the UK or Portugal? I mean, obviously the, the role that they played were different, but is there anything kind of unique to America about either pro or con about how we're addressing this issue here versus in other countries? Well, I, I think delicately put is that the, 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 the opportunity is, is here in our own home. In our own structures, I, I do something later in terms of, and I will go. I'm going to go back to the to the killings in Atlanta. Uh, if you start looking at simply legal law, uh, human rights law, if you start looking at kind of Supreme Court bills and just in terms of how white has been defined and how Asian has been defined and how Asian persons are not one welcome, and this is say go back to the 1924 Immigration Exclusion Act or the Asian Exclusion Act. There should be no surprise here about where this comes from. So we are still in a bit of a, a, a knee-jerk kind of response to this. Um, the, for example, the movement in, in Boston around Fennell Hall, who he was a major uh, uh, trafficker um, in, in bodies, and, and he's also a major philanthropist of the city. And so as someone says, well, so we're simply building another memorial to the enslavers. Uh, there is there is that particular moment is that it's it's in some ways easier to build a memorial to build a block to 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 write a nice poem to do this kind of um, I don't want to call it placating work uh, but I'm 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 uneasy with it because it's not completely all that it it sometimes obviates the need actually to do the work. And what about another question? So this topic is being in the news more every year, um, which is a good thing. But do you feel like there was a turning point where, you know, there was I mean, obviously people still want to sweep this under the rug or, or would like to. Um, but would, do you feel like there was a turning point that happened when this became more prevalent? People talking about this and wanting to raise these issues. 1967, we can start there with the founder of the Pink Panthers and their job. Their founding was to end police violence. Start. The first police force, as we know, was 1704 in North Carolina, or South Carolina, and it wasn't, uh, it was, they were vigilante to, it was, they were called slave patrols. The first organized police, as we know, was 1830 in Boston. But I, I would go back to the, I would go back to Martin Luther King in, in, in his book of Why We Cannot Wait. And he, he clearly lays out what we still have not yet come around with, um, the atrocity of our governments, and I say governments because um, it's like uh, Justice Gorsuch and the Supreme Court in, in the Oklahoma this summer. They kind of off the cuff uh, a note that says, well, Oklahoma is still, is still federal land, is still uh, Indian land. We have not yet come to terms with the original indigenous people, which is why 1619, however good of a project it is, and it's a great one, I use it and I like it and I recommend it, 
um, we need to, and I have one, I'm doing a thing here on the, and what I call extinction, when I talk about the indigenous persons in our own particular country. Uh, it's very difficult, but we need to go back and address that too. And then, uh, this is an interesting question. Someone asked, how come the Africans were targeted to be enslaved here and not say Asians or um, other? Oh, well, the Asians were. I mean, the West Coast, for example, which is why the, the U.S. Supreme Court said that Asians, the U.S., California Supreme Court in 1850 said that Asians cannot bring a, a law, bring a, a sort of sort a court suit against a white person because they are a species designed by nature to be lower. The building of the international of the Intercontinental Railroad was was done by largely Asian workers. As far as like going there, like going to a place and enslaving them and bringing yes. them here, yeah, they, they came here and uh, in as much as there was as much surf or as, as much in any kind of uh, forced labor. Um, why they came to, because as I, I, again, I tried to make out in this very quick overview of enslavement history. Um, there were, there are the, the economics and the mechanics, the network and the social memory of enslavement in the African countries, because they were so central, uh, sorry, to be grabbed by persons from Europe and the Middle East. Uh, and if I can say this, Robert, if I can say this, for example, if one were to go to Jamaica today, um, and the only way, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be blunt, the only way a white person can go to Jamaica today um, for commerce is usually on one of the buses that are sealed as you're going to one of the uh, cruise places. You know, uh, he doesn't one, he doesn't two, he doesn't three. You get off the plane, you get on the bus. The bus is locked, you travel to an enclave. Um, we, we are still not, we're still not dealing equitably with, with our, either our past or our presence. Okay, no problem. I think that answers the question. If not, um, the person can um, resend it over. And then let's see something about, here's a question. Do you think that Harry and Megan's current situation will leave an impact? Can I, can I make a laughing comment? Yes, please <laughs> make any kind of comment you like. <laughs> when I was in the Jesuit seminary in 1972, I lived in Montecito, California, a rock's throw from their $14.5 million monument, or what do you call it? Um, mass, ca castle? What you, I mean, estate. I, no, I don't think that their present situation is going to help much. Honestly, it's nice that they're going to make some, make some comments about it, and I, I will be interested to see what happens with the new rain coming up, because I do think that it was like in 1950 uh, in um, Australia. You're, they're at a moment where there's going to be a switch of some kind of change. But I think that Megan, and Hague, Megan, who I'm thinking has come to some senses himself, they clearly they have, and they are doing good work. They clearly are, you know. But they are still one of the, you know. I mean, there, there's. For them to say Black Lives Matter is, in fact, a sign of privilege, and and I, I understand that. I mean, I'm careful about that kind of virtue signaling. Oh, can you tell us more about the um, the other series that you're planning or thinking about in the future? Maybe just uh, give us a quick intro. Uh, there are six, <laughs> thank you. Three or four of them I've already talked about. One, the next next time we do this will simply be um, what I call slave nation. Specifics about the Anglo colonial enslavement systems in the colonials and then the US, first in the Caribbean and then in the nation. The third one is going to be called Rise. We, uh, actually, the third one is called uh, Stolen Bodies and Stolen Lives. And it looks at what is euphemistically called domestic traffic. And I, and I try to point out again how North is inculcated into what is, is going on here. And it looks at the movement back and forth from the North to the South of, I'm sorry to say it, but, but Black property. And while we don't, we talk about the numbers and we call it domestic traffic, we don't understand why the Louisiana Purchase was purchased. We don't understand why uh, the, the, the international slave trade ended. We don't understand that how after the revolution, the number of enslaved persons in the US, now not the colonies, 
increased by something like 75 percent so that by 1865 there was something like uh, 50 percent 60 percent more enslaved persons than at the uh, revolution itself if we were ending slavery i mean this 1619 has a spot on this is the the, the, the constitution is protecting slavery well uh, it's hard to you can't say no but because it's there um then i'm they're looking at uh, Another narrative that's that's particularly difficult to think about, and I call it rise. How does one talk about resistance? Um, I call it decolonization because these are a captive people in our political boundaries who have no no legal no legal right, none. Period. And however we want to whitewash that, to use that particular language, um, they cannot go to court. They had no country. They had no right. We were colonizing them. So how does one talk about that particular thing? And, and go back to the Black Panthers in the 60s, um, which is what they were trying to do okay, in their own kind of way. Uh, and then um, the last two are uh, the development of the white ethno state, and, and the, which brings us to the current. And finally, simply call it legal, in which we simply look at every law from the 1790 First Immigration Act, which specifies free white persons as immigrants. That's all as citizens. So legal looks at Declaration of Independence, it looks at the Constitution, it looks at all the laws, it looks at Birmingham, it looks at New York, it looks at the, the segregation of laws in Rhode Island, it just looks at the laws and when people say, well, I don't have any part in this, yeah, well, and there's an image in uh, 16, uh, 1967 of um, a black woman with a police officer in Selma on her neck. And I go, you know what, um, this is what, Freddie Hampton meant and the Black Panthers, um, we have somehow forgotten this past. So that George Floyd, may he rest in peace, has a history. And the last one will be uh, exterminate. And this will be the language of civil government, including George Washington around the native Indian. Oh, there. Ready this. I will. Um, why don't I catch up with you tomorrow and we can get the date for that ASAP so we can get that on the calendar because people are asking when when are these events going to be. Um, so I'll shoot you an email. We can get that coordinated. I did put Ed's contact information in the chat in Zoom if you're watching on Zoom. Um, it's also in the event description where you signed up. And then, like I said, um, we'll be happy to send out the information on the next one. We have been recording this and if all goes well, we'll put it on our YouTube page um, in case you joined us late. I apologize for my 14 year old puppy who has only one eye and is deaf. And if he, if he can't hear me or see me, he starts his little mournful howling in the back. So oh, that's, okay. that's okay. No, that's no problem. That's no problem at all. So, okay, Ed, well, thank you. Thanks for joining us again. It was great to get uh, educated on you and learn about this fascinating topic and look forward to hearing more from you in the near future. And Please. thanks everyone for joining us. Good night. Oh, you got a message from Susie. She said she loves your pup. <laughs> and Stefani instead of miss your dog. Thank Actually, you. some people some people I think want to see your dog at some point in time. <laughs> we'll we'll do that. We'll do that next time. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Happy spring. <laughs>